So the Ars Digital U experience, right now we're about, actually I see a bunch of the students here, you can ask them, seven months into the first, six months, seven months into the first year, six months. Um, the students seem to be learning the material. The people who teach both at MIT and at Ars Digital U, they say that the Ars Digital U students have actually done better than MIT students, which is remarkable considering, I mean, they are older, which gives them an edge, but uh, they come from uh, sort of math, a lot of them come from mathematically challenged backgrounds, shall we say, right? That's why they went majored in poetry back in Oxford or whatever. Uh, so I think an interesting thing about it is that it shows that cooperative on-site education is actually a lot more effective than sending people back to their dorm rooms. So now actually we're looking, maybe I'll work with Al on this. Uh, I've been talking to uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, so we're thinking of doing this project at MIT where we let all the students where we keep track of, for each student, what problems that he or she is working on and when, so that we can do a couple things. First is coaching. We can say, students who got A's in 6003 last year started the problem set two days before you're planning to start. Uh, and B, MIT already has tutors that are available. If you want a tutor, you can go. It's called the Office of Minority Education, but it's, in fact, available to anybody. Um, you can get a tutor, but you have to kind of schedule it. You have to go there. Um, it's uh, not very practical if you're kind of stuck at two in the morning. So we want to have a system where the students can connect up with each other and also connect up the tutors who then get paid for their time um, out of that system. So it's yielded some benefits, I think. We've learned some things out of this that uh, we can apply at MIT. And the interesting thing about ADU is if you look at, um, if you look at the vibrant economies so you look at Palo Alto and Silicon Valley area and Madison, Wisconsin. You know, University of Wisconsin has pretty good computer science, but not quite as good as Stanford. So it looks like elite computer science education where you really push people hard and have uh, a great curriculum. It looks like that can yield a tremendous amount of economic development. So the goal of ADU has really been to seed other places worldwide with the curriculum that they can just pick up and grab and methodology that they can just pick up and grab so that other people can start one-year computer science post back programs. So it's worked quite well. Um, and uh, anyway, that's the last resort. So basically, if you really want to learn how to do this stuff and you don't, I think the best thing to do is just get the basic undergraduate computer science knowledge, which is doable in about nine months at ours digital U. And uh, I guess if you're a special student or something at a regular university, it could take several years just because of the schedule. So let me um, take a question or two, and then we'll let people go. I was just uh, noticing that some of the community sites, like the one that the photo is uh, supported by your work, and then, um, or by like this new site, um, you know, obviously it's a budget from the fact that they have a lot of money to spend. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could know examples of Yeah, the, the question is, how do these online communities support themselves financially? Um, I wish I knew. <laughs> U.S. law isn't really a community site because they have all these lawyers, and if you have a legal problem, you eventually get referred through to a lawyer or stuff. I mean, Photo.net, the obvious way to support that is to make sure that Photo.net members are buying their cameras somehow through the site. It's just like, you know, you can buy a book, click through to Amazon, and get a referral free from Amazon. Photo.net, in the long run, really has to become an easier place for people who like it to shop through it and get the commission back to photo.net. Um, I mean, a lot of these sites actually probably can support themselves on advertising, although it's a little bit crass and a little bit annoying. But I think Slashdot is a good example of a site that you know, has pretty high ad rates, and they have a good demographic and tremendous amount of traffic. And they didn't spend too much. You know, that was two guys in a Linux box. So their costs, Slashdot. So your costs weren't all that high. If you keep your costs down and do some community moderation, don't go crazy. I mean, by contrast, I know a guy, we tried to hire him. I don't know if we ever did. We wanted to hire him for our digital sysadmin because we worshipped his Solaris and Oracle capability. So he said, um, <clears throat> he said, I've got uh, an EMC disk array, which is a wonderful, you know, multi-gigabyte, huge machine the size of uh, a couple of refrigerators. 
and I've got two of the biggest Sun E10,000s as my Oracle server, running Oracle Parallel Server that's redundant. And then I've got an application server layer in the middle with uh, dozens of big Solaris machines running an application server environment. And then I've got a cloud of web servers out front. And then I've got a load balancer in front of that. And it took us a year just to plug all this stuff together and get it to work to serve one web page. And then we spent another couple of years building this financial app. And uh, you know, it turned out the company isn't doing so well because we only have 10 users. There's only 10 people who wanted to use this app. And I said, wow, you have like seven Solar Spark processors per user. <laughs> and not per continuously connected user. That was 10 registered users. So probably there's only one at a time on the site. And uh, you know, it was a miracle of server farm. So if you ask, how is that guy going to make money? Um, you know, I really don't know. <laughs> but if, he'd, if they'd run the thing on a Netra T1, which is an inch high sun machine, uh, then you know, they'd have a better chance. So sometimes technology does matter. Usually not. I mean, most people, maybe they'll download ours digital community system and get their community up and running in an afternoon on a Linux box. You know, maybe they'll um, spend six months and a lot of money doing it. But you know, for a lot of these organizations, that's not uh, really where it's at. But I'm not a business guy. Ask Caesar. He's not here. He's on vacation. Ask Joe. He's a smart guy. He's in the corner. Question? So why do you do this? What, what do you get out of These one-day talks? Well, Edward Tufte told me to do it. <clears throat> so basically, um, you've got to know your limits. So you've got to know. You know, when you're dealing with somebody who is a lot uh, more thoughtful than you are. So, you know, I'm a computer programmer, and Edward Tufte is a great thinker. So he said basically that universities, like, well, he t was teaching at Yale, and, um, you know, I was at MIT. So he said basically universities are, you know, these way of perpetuating an elite, and you really need to get out there on the road and, you know, talk to people. And it's, it's much better to, it is true sometimes we have students, I mean, some of our students don't even show up to lectures. They're so disaffected after four years of, being you know reamed out of as much tuition as we can get, and you know they want to have a college degree because well, it's just like me. I I quit high school when I was 14, and I went right into college, and I graduated from college when I was 18 instead of sailing around the world, which would have been a much better thing to do. But you know, I just didn't occur to me that I thought, well, I'm done with high school. I better start college. I mean, so a lot of our students are in, in any college. It's not really an MIT problem, but they're there just because it's socially. Uh, it's not socially acceptable for them to do something else. Uh, so whereas you, if you give a talk like this, you know, you get people who really want to learn the information, they really are going to go out and use it. It's a little bit different. I mean, at MIT, I, you know, it's a little bit harder core <laughs> during the semester. <laughs> but uh, so that's why. I mean, it's fun to talk to people. And more questions? And it's fun now that we have ours Digita, we can actually get lunch paid for. We. I started out doing this in really crummy MIT lecture halls on weekends when they turned the heat off and didn't tell us. <laughs> Just soda machine. Out. People had to go to Aubon Pain for French cuisine for lunch. Question? Does our digital development system using all different technologies or only? Does our digital develop system using other technologies than ACS? Um, well, our digital is pretty lazy. So basically, you know, if you're a lazy developer, you say, well, I know how to use Solaris and Oracle. And if you tell me that, well, using an IBM mainframe in DB2 is much better, you know, it might be true. But if Oracle and Solaris can do the job, generally Ars Digita would say um, that uh, we should just use that. As far as Ars Digita community system goes, I mean, remember, Ars Digita is a product company and always has been. It just looks like a service company because all enterprise software starts out you know, with a lot of services and engaged with real customers. Um, because it's open source, most closed source packages like ACS, ha actually I've heard American Airlines is going to throw out Broadvision. As far as I know, there's no company that's ever thrown out ACS because it doesn't make any sense. In other words, if there's parts of ACS that you don't like, you can just stop using them. You can throw that little piece out or you can just stop using it and develop your own Oracle table and a bunch of scripts that talk to it. So basically, it's never been necessary. I mean, people don't come to Ars Digital and say, I really want a site that you know, uses Broadvision. 
they come to Ars Digital and they say, I really want a site that offer, that lets 50 people collaborate on producing last minute travel packages and then offering them to consumers and you know, how do we want to build that? So some of the sites that Ars Digital builds, you might almost say that they don't use ACS because they're kind of idiosyncratic. So site59.com is actually a good example. They don't have bulletin boards. I mean, they don't actually have too many of the things that are in photo.net but they still use the ACS user model on some of the admin pages. And, you know, and then they have this airline reservation system interface. So I don't know. You want a broad vision app developed? Go to, who should you go to? Scient, <laughs> if they're still around. <laughs> who has a question? Yeah, that's a good question. So at what point do you, how, how do you prune this stuff? I think on photo.net it's a harder problem than I happen to know that the questioner works for Cisco. So I think it's an easier problem at Cisco than at photo.net because at Cisco there's a whole bunch of discussion about say a product and once that product's not made anymore, you know, you can pretty much deprecate all that content. It's still in the database, you search it, you deliver it to people who are you know, searching uh, for last resort. But I think that you can prune a lot of stuff by age, particularly if they're talking about products. Like at photo.net, if we had a structured tree of all possible camera equipment, and we just kept track of which you know, are still being sold by Nikon, um, then you, know, you promote the discussion about current equipment ahead of the content about discontinued stuff. Um, a lot of it does come down to editing, which on photo.net has been awfully sloppy because we don't have a budget. Um, there is the software supports you know interest level, so you can have editors say, look, this is really interesting, and then you can have a program that said, well, if there's more than 500 threads, you know, cut it down and only show the first, uh, the, the the 150 most interesting ones, and then have a more button for people who, who still want more. So I mean, it's easy to program. It's hard to kind of conceptualize, and it's even harder to get the organizational commitment to making it happen. More questions? Uh, I, I've been talking to a bunch of people in different areas about different app servers and stuff, the JQE people, the, the WebSphere people, the ACS people, the ACS people talk. And I haven't figured out why different people, different kinds of developers or clients gravitate to one another. Do you have any insight? Well, OK, so the question is, why do people gravitate to one app server or another? I mean. <laughs> yeah, so uh, at Ars Digita, we sort of used to have this, we used to go out and tell people you really ought to use two-tier system, a web server and a database and a load balancer in front of your web, web servers and you can handle you know, ar almost arbitrarily high traffic. Um, and we found that you know, for, there are two kinds of people. There were people who just wanted their application to work and when you told them that they didn't listen because they didn't care. Um, and there were CTO types who had already decided that if you didn't have WebSphere, um, that you couldn't possibly have a working site. And WebSphere implied three tiers. So as soon as we said two tiers are good, they're like, oh, you guys are idiots. <laughs> so we were idiots, actually, because we kept saying this. And finally, last summer, I said, you know, maybe we should just shut up. Maybe since we have a Java version of ACS that can run in one tier, which is just the regular Oracle server with a built-in web server. Uh, it can run in two tiers, it can run in three tiers. If you consider load balancing and um, SSL encryption, because you can put those on separate boxes to be tiers, you could actually run, we, we, we could show you how to run ACS in five tiers if that's what you want. So you know, we decided that it'd be smarter to, if a user comes to us and says, I have so many transactions per day that I need to support, to show them the minimally complex infrastructure that would um, you know, be adequate for that. Um, which gets you out of that situation like I was talking about, that fellow that we tried to hire that spent a whole year just plugging together the Solaris boxes. Uh, but if they come to us, you know, if somebody came, comes to me now and you know, wants to start an argument about how you need you know, four tiers and particular brands of app server, you know, I would say, well, great, here's how um, you, know, you can use ours digital community system uh, 
the Java version to uh, to run in that environment. When I was thinking about the layer on Mozilla, like there's 200 yards from here, there's APG, and then we have a suite of Java tools with our competitors, just uh, with ACS, for instance. WebSphere, a bunch of gas servers, or a bunch of standard components and so on. It seems to me there's something sociological going on here, not just technical. I was wondering if you had any. Well, this, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, so all these closed source things I never thought were very interesting because the problem is getting, the problem is so complicated. So closed source spreadsheets are really interesting, like Microsoft Excel, because the users all want sort of the same things that are a very effective uh, solution to those user needs. But on the web, it looks like, <clears throat> I think there's a, I think uh, somebody showed me, I hate to keep citing these, like Forrester guys or Bain or whoever it was, but they showed that for the typical enterprise resource planning system and a typical ERP system, which is accounting like SAP, that uh, people spent three times as much on customization and installation as they spent on the software product. But that for these web things, the number was more like 10 to 15 times. So that leads me to believe that whatever you're getting from a closed source vendor like ATG or Broad Vision or whatever, it's not really solving your problem because you're ending up spending you know, millions and millions of dollars doing custom programming and it's not a surprise, like we never expected ACS to solve everybody's problem out of the box because we figured that as ideas keep getting more and more radical, even if we keep expanding our software, the front of what business people want to do with the internet keeps expanding in ways that we can't anticipate. So um, I think that's why open source is the answer because it's very, very hard. You know, why is American Airlines flushing broad vision? It's because, because it's closed source, and there's no human way for a developer to anticipate all the possible things that you want to do in an API. They have to check it. Whereas, again, ACS, nobody's ever had to check because you can always go down to the Oracle level, alter a table, um, and be back up and running. But I don't know. It's not interesting why people spend money. Maybe they spend it because it's comforting to them. <laughs> No, 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 Postgres is an open source database management system. MySQL is, it's like Photoshop. I mean, it, it does, MySQL is as comparable, is as good a substitute for Oracle as Adobe Photoshop is a substitute for Oracle. So it's not a database, <laughs> it doesn't, it's a fine program. I mean, I like Photoshop, but Photoshop doesn't give you atomicity, um, con consistency, isolation, or durability. <coughs> And uh, that's why I don't use it to store my data. Is that what you were going to ask? No, I was going to ask if there was an open source um, database that you would recommend. Yeah, there is a real open source database called Postgres. And actually, Gerald, are you going to stand up for this one? <laughs> um, he was an honest MIT grad, but then he went to Sloan, um, which is why he's difficult. So. Uh, Postgres, there actually is a complete port of uh, ACS to Postgres instead of Oracle. And that's the only open source relational database management system. Actually, I take that back. SAP developed its own RDBMS some years ago, and they recently open sourced it. And for all I know, it might be uh, as good as Postgres. Postgres is a spin off of a, an old Berkeley project. And now there's a 30 person company. Developing, so it could be good actually. If you look at the Microsoft team on SQL Server, it's not that much larger. Oracle is enormous. I mean, they have a lot of developers because they sort of shoot for a lot of weird problems. Question? What, what structural changes have you anticipated for, let's say, like Photoshop having a component with the migration towards near real time services, voice, video? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. What structural changes have we anticipated for Photo.net with all these real time services like? voice and WAP, really not much. I mean, the infrastructure underneath of Oracle can handle quite a few transactions. It's really an imagination challenge, and we still haven't sort of conquered that. I think the one piece of infrastructure that we really need is our own phone number where people can call in and have their voice digitized and have that digitized clip get stuffed in appropriate places in the database, get emailed as an attachment to the people who asked the question. I think that's the one sort of plumbing piece that we, that we lack that we need. Question? Yeah. Um Right now, you have a lot of websites that have their own online community, and you have a lot of fragmentation, but they may all have common themes. So somebody like on PhotoNet or Nokia or Delphi, they all might be talking about photography. Do you see the possibility of um, collaboration of online communities where they can all come together on one 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So the observation is, you know, we have all these 1970s style sort of islands of information systems, and Photo.net is one of them with a bunch of community, and then AOL actually has a very vibrant photographer's community. They have a couple, I think, one for amateurs, one for professionals. Uh, so do I see these things hooking uh, together in some way? So Microsoft would certainly say, yes, absolutely. The right thing is to hook all, them, all of them together, and you have one big photography community. Um, so Microsoft would say that, and .NET is an attempt to make it a little bit easier technologically. Um, Amitai Etzioni, I think, would say, no, it's the wrong thing. That basically, there's people who like AOL, and they have certain beliefs in that community, and that's why they're there. And the photo.net people don't agree with those AOL people. There's areas where they really uh, don't interact very well, and they're not going to. So basically, you know, if, if you're writing a business plan for photo.net, you probably do want to say, oh, you know, in 19, oh, sorry, in uh, the year 2005, we're going to have you know every person on the planet connecting to photo.net every day. But Amitai Etzioni would say that's not going to work. That that's not that's not going to be a community. That's going to be an aggregation. I think much more likely is that Photo.net can start taking little drinks of services from other sites. So, for example, a lot of Photo.net people might read an article about, um, I don't know, uh, some particular photo destination like Alaska, and it'd be nice to have, you know, a little snippet of the weather information for Alaska, what it's going to be like in a month, airline reservations to Alaska, all those other things pulled more seamlessly from other sites. Well, I hate to I hate to do this again, but if you go to netscan.research.microsoft.com, <laughs> ah, so these guys have done elaborate sociological studies of the Microsoft Developers Network news groups. So uh, cross post visualization. So this shows alt.fan.billgates, how related that is to alt.destroy.microsoft. <laughs> so there's cross postings between, you know, destroy Microsoft with comp.misc.microsoft and eventually it gets to alt.misc.billyjoel. <laughs> That's just the default. You can use this, I think, to compare um, any group of statistics. You can, you know, it can filter out weaker ties. So it's kind of an interesting, they've taken an interesting approach to that. What else do they have that's interesting? Um, oh, yeah. Average line count. They actually, PP ratio, I forget what that is, but it's basically, they calculate things like ratios of questions to answers to decide if it's a more discursive forum where people get into long, elaborate discussions, whether it's um, or whether a lot of questions are going unanswered. They also look at people. So they basically they can figure out who's a flamer by looking at people who are consistently, you know, if you really have a question about how to use VB, it's probably not going to result in a 50 message thread on Usenet. Probably you ask your question, you get an answer. But if somebody says, you know, I think that the new VB7 features suck, and then you get some huge flame war. Um, so they can actually find the people who are just flamers um, because they are constantly participating in these super long this sessions. This is a sort of a web front end to Usenet. But it's, I think that the same kind of analytical methods could be applied very productively to, say, photo.net discussions. Most of the same the ideas apply. So yeah, netscan.research.microsoft.com. They hired a PhD sociologist out of UC Irvine named Mark Smith. His advisor was Peter Kollek, who's been thinking about this for a long time. These are interesting guys. Any more questions? Well, time's up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let people who want to go go. And I'll stay up here to answer questions privately for as long as people need. So thanks a lot for coming.